We also uh, want to pay attention to in the chat. Uh, we have put in the remote conference caption for those who uh, would like to use the closed caption option. Uh, that is also there. And I want to first of all acknowledge uh, if we have folks on the line who are from our um, HHS, who are leaders who are here, also other agency representatives. We see your name in the Slido. Thank you for coming. I want to acknowledge my um, colleagues, DMAS executive leadership team who's here, including our fearless leader, Director Cheryl Roberts. Thank you so much for being here. And also I see many members of our Office of the Chief Medical Officer team. Thank you for coming as well as DMAS and all of our stakeholders. For those who are just joining, I'm Lisa Price Stevens. I am the Chief Medical Officer for DMAS. I have been in this wonderful role for three months and have the opportunity to facilitate this wonderful meeting. With that, we're going to keep moving on I want to review with you the purpose of the committee and why we're, we are here. Um, you actually have set the agenda today. I appreciate all who participated in the survey saying what you wanted to accomplish in this meeting, and we'll go through that in just a moment, but I appreciate the fact that this is an engaged committee and you have set the agenda. This committee was formed out of a GA mandate initiated in 2013. And basically the committee was formed to uh, give a forum, give a platform for productive communication and dialogue between Medicaid providers, managed care organizations, and DMAS. And as you see here, the call to action is that we are to work with the department to investigate the implementation of quality and cost effective healthcare initiatives, were to identify means to increase provider participation in the Medicaid program. Also, we need your guidance and engagement and feedback on how we can remove the administrative obstacles to quality cost effective patient care and to address other matters that are raised by the department. So thank you for your commitment. As part of that mandate, we have representation uh, that is highly recommended and suggested, and, and many of you are here because you belong to these organizations as listed here. The committee is to meet semi-annually or more frequently, and I'm hoping that we are able to meet more frequently. There is a report that is sent um, from this committee to our board, also to the chair of the House Appropriation and Senate Finance Committee, and also, of course, to Department of Planning and Budget. In addition to the call to action that I just mentioned, we are also to have formed an Emergency Department Care Coordination Committee, which is in place now. And we are active in that committee as many of you. And so not during this meeting, but during our next meeting, we will be giving a report of the actions of uh, the committee. And now to go over our robust agenda for the next hour, as I said, I'm here to be your facilitator. Please feel free to use the chat to communicate, to ask questions, and we have team members who are managing the chat. But before we go any further, I want to uh, introduce to many of you, um, someone who you know very well, our director and fearless leader, uh, Director Cheryl Roberts, who's going to um, provide a DMAS update. Greetings, everyone. If one question I do have for you, um, who's who has the screen to move it? OK, someone else does that helped. OK, first of all, of course, I'm going to say something to make you all smile. I am officially and I need a new tattoo. I am a Barbie Oppenheimer person. OK, so for those women, hello, Barbie. OK, and for those other people who have seen it. So in the chat, can you say if you saw either the Barbie or the Oppenheimer movie? To contribute to our economy. And, and if you want, put the third Mission Impossible, because of course, you know, I, I love that one too. I'm a movie person. All right, so while you're thinking those happy thoughts, okay, I will go and tell you quickly. All right, um, everyone knows our mission. Um, that has not, ch not changed. Uh, we have a commitment, obviously, that goes across the spectrum from a woman who is actually having children to all the way through the end of life. Uh, we cover 2.1 million people, love them and, and involved in them. Let's go to the next one. 
If you had to ask the question, this is what we look like at this point. Uh, adults include our Medicaid expansion. Children are now number two. Uh, we could tell that we still have people with limited benefits. <laughs> and I like that in terms of that. Uh, in each of these cases, the department is working very diligently to make sure that people have health care services, access to services, and as well as support things. I, I tell people that I'm doing both health care and life care services, trying to keep people alive. Next. The next one. There are three projects for 2023. I lovingly tell my staff that means there'll be four for 24 and five for 25 and they keep the Adria keeps shaking her head. She was, okay, so yes, and that means that we could you, you we keep going. But the three things that are important, we're going to talk about them individually. One is the unwinding, um, the renewal of, of two million people. Um, as most people know that when we had the pandemic, the federal government wisely suggested that everyone needed health care coverage. And therefore, they asked all the states to freeze basically what they were doing in terms of pr their normal processing. The question is, how do you start it off again? And this is the hard piece, especially when two things happen. One is that social service and most of the systems, people are new. They've never done a reprocessing, so this is all new. And then because we did the, if you would look at the timing, we had just started the expansion, which means that most people had never, remember that 800,000 people? Those people had never done a, a redetermination. And then as you all know, I've said this a million times, people who are the age of 20 to 30 do not like to open up envelopes. Okay, they don't like administration. So that combination makes it challenging across the board nationally. However, very, very, very proud of the work that this team has done in DMAS uh, to make sure that people won. We took a proactive line in the beginning to try to get addresses changed, to staff up, to do the system work, to do all the outreach and education, a constant look. And even now, uh, my team can confirm that it's on a daily basis. We're looking at the numbers and making sure that A, that as many things that we can, we're automating. And number two is that we're reaching out to make sure that people have the information. And number three, if they have the, if something happened to them adversely, we're here to help. And I do want that process. But the question is, what can you do? I'm going to say it over and over again. If you're a provider, please be conscious of this. Please tell your, 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 your associates as well as your, your, the patients to please, please, if they get an envelope, to open the envelope and to do something with it, even if it's just to make a phone call. The second thing I'm telling everyone is to memorize this telephone number, 833-5-CALL-VA. And the reason I'm telling you to do that is because no matter how it goes, and wherever you are, if you meet someone who has a question about their eligibility or the unwinding, tell them to call that number and Cover Virginia will help them. Okay, that's the biggest thing. Cover Virginia will help. All right, number two, we go to the next slide. The governor's number one project is behavior health. We can talk about that forever. Um, that turns out to be one of the major issues, not just Virginians, for all people in the United States. And the project is called Right Help Right Now. Uh, the number to remember is 988. If someone has a suicide or, or needs a crisis, uh, they can call 988 instead of 911. There's someone there 24 seven who can talk to them and help them. We're finding that if people can talk to someone right away, they don't do anything further. So this is a great help. But the project is actually um, six tiers and the six tiers um, are working on different issues. We're working on crises, not just on the crisis services, but the prevention of crises where we can. The second one is working with law enforcement and what we call TDLs so that people get the right service and the right, so they're not going from the crises into jail or the crises only into the hospital. So we're working on those services. We're working on capacity. We're working on workforce. We're doing a substance abuse, which is very, very close to the governor, but also mine. Um, fentanyl is very, very big here in Virginia. Unfortunately, fentanyl overdoses. My 25 year old has been to four funerals this year. Um, the reason that is such a bad thing is in that sense is you could go to a party 
a young person and actually wind up not coming back um, because people put fentanyl in so many things. The second thing that we found out with fentanyl is that we're having kids zero to five die of fentanyl overdoses eating gummies. Because um, uh, a kid, little kid will pick up a gummy, right? And say gummy and not realize that gummy could kill them. Um, so we do have a, a major issue on the substance abuse side. And then last but not least, um, it's the thing that DMS is working on, which is services. And um, and so all of you are involved in, in that. So what we hope for is as it starts to roll out and you're going to see new things coming out about what we're doing for behavior health, we'll be asking for your input and your support. Next one. This one is the one everybody, the drum roll is ready. And the question is, is it's time to procure. If you think about it, the last time we procured was in 16 and 17. Wasn't that a long time ago? Now the health plans are going to go. That was yesterday, but that's a long time. And what I tell people, and they ask that, TikTok didn't exist, and um, and this word social determinants didn't exist back then. It's actually back then. And so what we're trying to do as a state is to make sure that we have the most current and the best services that we can buy. We're leveraging what we know and our experience, and we're trying to um, elevate and upgrade. Um, I feel like Sierra of going to upgrade. Oh, maybe that's Beyonce. Is it Beyonce who upgrades? Beyonce. Well, it's Beyonce. Beyonce. I get to see her Saturday, so I'll have lots of Beyonce songs, Chris. So everybody's going to hear Beyonce songs next week. But anyway, that's what we're trying to do. Oh, good hearts. Somebody loves Beyonce. So see, so what we're going to do is we're releasing the RFP in the, this summer. This summer. So please be on the lookout. And when you ask the question, what is summer? Because Craig is going to ask me that. I can see Craig Connor saying, show what is summer? Summer and September 15th. So somewhere between now and September 15th, we'll be releasing the RFP. The goal of the RFP is to make sure that we're increasing our leverage and our purchasing power in many, many situations. We want to build on what is good. We want to keep what is good and build on what is good as we then expand to talk about things that we would like to see. All right. Any questions on my side? No, we okay. appreciate that. And I'm trying to work the slides and look at the chat. But if someone could please put that cover Virginia number in the chat um, for us. 833-5-CALL-VA. And Jeff, Jeff was the new chief deputy. Jeff, did you memorize that number? OK. All right. Thank you so much, um, Director Roberts. We appreciate you. And as I stated before, you actually created this agenda. For those of you who participated in the survey, it was asked, what would you like DMAS to talk about? And this was something you wanted to hear about. So I appreciate Director Roberts helping us. You also said that you wanted to have hybrid meetings. So although this meeting is virtual, our next meeting will be in person and we plan to have more frequent meetings. It's important for this team to get together and collaborate. You also said that you wanted to hear from DMAS about our the uh, PRSS work and provider directory. So we actually have a team here who's going to talk about that. And following them, we're also going to follow your lead, as you indicated in the survey, that you want to hear from our MCO partners, how they are covering maternity services, and also what are some of the partnership activities that they've done and the health outcomes related to that. So we heard you. We're listening. And we are going to continue on with our agenda. So with that, I am going to uh, stop sharing and we're going to have Tammy Driscoll who's going to uh, talk about PRSS. Tammy, you're on mute. There yeah, you go. thank you. I was um, happy that you all uh, asked us to come and talk to you a little bit about uh, the Cures Act, and um, the question that 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 was posed to us is, why do managed care providers need to enroll with the state? 
Um, so the, the answer to that is because it's the federal law. So the law known as the 21st Century Cures Act requires all uh, providers to enroll with the state, including managed care providers. And what that means is that in order for a provider to be in the MCO's network, they have to be enrolled with the state. And also in order for the MCO to pay one of their network, Medicaid network providers, uh, that provider has to be enrolled with the state. So the, the two key takeaways is that uh, the reason that managed care providers need to enroll with the state is so that they can be in the health plans network and that they can receive um, Medicaid dollars uh, for services rendered. Um, and that's known as the 21st Century Cures Act. And like all states, um, this is you know required of all states, Virginia is being closely monitored by CMS for compliance. Um, in December of 22, uh, we um, worked with the MCOs to identify which providers are in the MCOs network, um, but not yet enrolled with the state and we identified approximately 27,000 providers that we needed to get enrolled. And so since that time, uh, DMAS has been working closely with the health plans uh, to do outreach to those providers and get them enrolled, particularly the providers who were needed for network adequacy or to uh, mitigate any disruption to member care. What we learned is that um, a lot of those 27,000 providers really weren't providing care to members. Um, some of them had closed shop. You know, there were some COVID closures uh, that didn't get reported to the plans. Uh, so um, where we are at this time is that we have enrolled or terminated 87% um, of those providers. So we have a, a little bit more work to go, but we're sitting at pretty much a B plus right now uh, we have enrolled or terminated 87% uh, to reach full compliance and CMS uh, expects full compliance by September 1st. Uh, we need to um, enroll or terminate the last uh, few providers. It's right around 4,000. And so we could really use your help. Um, one thing that we, another thing that we have done is we created a dedicated web page for providers. And on that web page, um, I'll put it in the chat here in just a few minutes. Uh, we um, have created uh, background information on what the requirement is and why it's important, um, as well as uh, an Excel spreadsheet that providers can download and quickly identify any of their NPIs, any of their national provider identifiers who are not enrolled. So all of our um, Cures Act compliant providers are listed in that Excel spreadsheet. And um, that way uh, it's the source of truth. Providers can see, uh, oh, I'm missing a couple of NPIs. Thought I had, had them all enrolled, but I'm missing a few. So. Um, we've got that uh, dedicated web page with the resources as well as contact information. So um, if they have any questions on how to enroll, um, we, we do have the enrollment by way of a, um, an online um, provider friendly uh, web based application that they can submit their application. And uh, we also have um, a help desk with our PRSS vendor Gainwell who can address their questions um, as well as MCO points of contact. So one of the things that they do when they submit their application is they identify which health plans they uh, intend to participate um, and the MCOs will update their um, PAR status with that particular plan. So if the provider has any questions on um, which plans uh, the system demonstrates that they are enrolled. They, we have um, MCO contacts on standby to answer their questions about that piece as well. Um, so what we can use your help uh, by helping us to spread the word. Uh, any providers who aren't enrolled, we, we want them. If they want to participate, we want them to enroll. And we've created this web page uh, to make it 
uh, provider friendly. We're available to answer any questions that they have. And so as we um, near the finish line, um, if providers do receive termination letters from the health plans, um, the way that they can remedy that is to submit an application. And so once providers have a pending application, um, the health plan will reverse their ter the termination for as long as the provider has is pending. Um, so again, the reason that they need to enroll, a reason managed care providers need to enroll with Medicaid is to comply with the federal law. And uh, we're available to do all we can to help them enroll, but we can't waive the requirement because it's a federal law. So what questions do you have? And Tammy, we we're seeing if one of the team members are going to try to show screen to that um, site that you just referenced. So I think Michelle may be working on that, but definitely thank you and want to open it up for questions about this process. Yeah, I can Before drop the link in the chat yeah. if you want, or do you have it already, Michelle? Yes, please give me the link. That's what I was going to ask. I wasn't oh, sure okay. which specific site you were referring to. And I, oh. can, I can share it. OK, let's see. So any questions um, from our providers, please feel free to come off mute and ask. Uh, this is something that you requested as a part of our agenda, so we want to make sure that we address this for you. Tammy, I mean, you were so thorough there, like fully educated, understand completely. No further questions. Well, for those who are shy, you can put it in the chat or you can private chat Tammy Driscoll and she'll be glad to speak with you. Uh, we also have Tia Lewis who is on and other SME in this area as well as uh, Michelle who is sharing screen. So Michelle, do you want to kind of walk us through or maybe Tammy can and just kind of reference some of the highlights? I So I, I'm happy to walk them through if you want to uh, just display the screen, uh, Michelle, that's OK. Um, so the first part of the screen um, provides an overview of the Cures Act. And then if you um, scroll down a little bit, we have the call to action to providers and a um, couple of links here. The first one is where they can go um, to enroll. And uh, the second link is where they can check their enrollment status. That's uh, provider extract spreadsheet there um, that is updated every uh, Monday. And um, so if, if providers, um, as providers enroll, we're continually updating that spreadsheet. Um, if a provider has submitted an application and they have a pending application, they would be able to, um, they, they, will, they will get information back once they submit that application on how they can check the status um, and respond to any follow up information. Uh, so if you want to scroll down a little bit more, um, there's where they can um, uh, receive assistance through Gainwell. Um, the provider enrollment PRSS vendor is 888-829-5373 and then their um, email address there. And then a little further down, we have all of our MCO provider relations points of contact. All right, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move on to our next agenda item. But before excuse doing, excuse me, Dr. Price, even someone had a question um, before we started showing the screen. Yeah. Craig Connors. Okay. Yeah. yeah quick question. Um, could you confirm for the group? Because I think other others may have stakeholders have the same question. I've heard for some of our health systems that they thought they were enrolled, but they're not showing up on the spreadsheet, and so maybe they aren't enrolled. Can you just confirm that the way to, to verify that the enrollment went through and is official is by the spreadsheet? Yes. If they're not on the yes. spreadsheet, they're not enrolled. There's something that else is, wrong. is that correct? Yes, there's a great question. That's a great okay. question. So um, early on, uh, we, you know, we um, converted some information from our MMIS to our new MES system, and um, Providers have been able to operate under a conversion registered status, but they're not they're not enrolled. They haven't been screened, so they're really not enrolled. Um, they can see that status in the provider portal, uh, but it it is not the same thing as being enrolled. It's another reason that we created the spreadsheet 
as the source of truth document. So you are absolutely correct. The provider extract spreadsheet here is where they would check to see if they're enrolled. If they're listed, they are enrolled. They only need to enroll once, but if they're not listed, then they're not enrolled. And again, if they have questions about what they're seeing in the spreadsheet versus what they're seeing in the portal, they can contact Gamewell. Didn't know if um, Pia or Michelle had anything to add to that. No, uh, Tammy, I don't have anything to add. I did add a great uh, email box into the chat as well. So okay. if you have any questions or uh, if you get stuck, you can always ask mask at dmask.virginia.gov and we have a team of provider service um, experts that can kind of help uh, navigate you and help you with your question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for that question. And thank you, Kier. Kier is from our pharmacy team um, for helping to man the chat. Michelle, can you stop sharing uh, for a moment, please? Appreciate you doing that for us too. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Tammy. And thank you, Tia, for your partnership. Okay, so before we um, continue on with our MCOs, I uh, want you to pull out your cell phone one more time and answer this question for me, if you could. Want to understand how you like to receive information. Just put on your camera, hover over the, the scan and answer the question. Sorry. Okay, let's see if I can scoot this down. I will come back with the results. Thank you. Uh, there is a method to that madness there um, on how you like to receive. Looks like the backwards are winning. Um, so this will be interesting. 86% see the horse walking backwards and 13% see the horse walking forward. Which one are you? All right. So now we're going to move on to our MCOs. Part of the um, questionnaire asked, what would you like to know or hear from the MCOs? And that was um, two questions. Uh, what is your stand on uh, maternity services? How do you cover? What do you, how are you covering those maternity services? And which one, particularly uh, midwife services? And then also the MCOs would tell us about some of their awesome partnerships with providers and what have those outcomes been? So in no order of importance at all, just uh, starting with the M's. Hey, in the middle of the, of the alphabet. So Melina, each MCO has about five minutes or so. So can you tell us uh, some of the things you're doing and answer those great questions from our providers? Okay, you want top and bottom questions, questions one and questions two? Yes, why not? Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so as far as midwife referee care, we do credential and have in-network midwives. Um, we do have in-network birthing centers um, that members can deliver at. Um, we have not historically covered home births, and a lot of that is related to the folks that are um, doing those home births versus those um, providers that are doing births in the birthing centers or the, um, the hospitals. Uh, so that is the topic question number one that we had as far as deliveries and maternity care. Um, question number two, which is the one that I really enjoy getting to answer, um, it talked about innovative projects and I can't take credit for this one. There was a really great um, CMO in my place before I arrived that I think helped develop this program, but it was actually really interesting because I had seen it at another um, MCO where the provider had actually liked the program so much that they had carried it other to, over to other groups and it's related to our sickle cell program. Um, so as you guys are probably very well aware there are not a lot of providers in the Commonwealth of Virginia that are offering sickle cell care, particularly to adults. Um, VCU is one of those providers that does an extraordinary job of really trying to wrap around patients for a large part of the state. There are certainly other providers, Northern Virginia, the western part of the state, um, who are doing a lot of sickle cell care as well. But in, here in Central Virginia, we see that for VCU picks up a lot of it, um, including some of that care that's coming from the eastern part of the state since there are not many providers down there anymore. Um, so our team 
sought to try and, and really make an inclusive, comprehensive mechanism by which to care for those members um, by collaborating with VCU. And we actually have rounds. Sometimes they're monthly, sometimes they're every other month. And we actually bring all of our shared patients together. So anyone that has um, any needs, so it could be behavioral health, it could be medication challenges, it could be non-compliance, it could be ED utilization, whatever those things might be drivers for concern, either on our side, on VCU side, um, we're bringing those to the table and trying to collaboratively discuss them. So we have their docs, we have their social workers, we have their nursing team. Um, same thing on our side. We bring all those folks to the table and really try and collaborate to understand how best um, to, to care for our members. And it's it's helped us impact utilization for several of these members um, from a perspective of when you're talking about MME for narcotics, when you're talking about ED visits, hospitalizations. So it's been a very positive project that we um, kicked off a couple years ago. Um, something more recent, um, when we're talking about BH services provided to our kids, um, you know, DMAS came to us a few months ago saying we're really struggling trying to provide for, provide, find providers for certain services. Um, we utilize the resource, um, the RBHA, you know, they're such a fantastic resource when it comes to behavioral health um, support, particularly for Richmond, but they also do scope out and offer services for a lot of folks from across the state to come to them as well. Um, and we were able to use their guidance, their wisdom to really help us shape how we're thinking about suggesting, um, you know, and, and collaborating with our providers of how to, to look at cases collaborating with our own internal team, our care managers, how to help about thinking, supporting our membership. And so I think that um, from a conversation I had earlier today, it all comes down to communication. Um, so really reaching out and, you know, going to our providers and saying, how can we help you? Um, and those have been some really successful collaborations. And so um, things that I was excited to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any questions for Melina about the awesome program that they've started and also their um, maternity services? Kiri, you're watching the chat for me, I'm sure. Let me know. OK. Um, did you introduce yourself, doctor, to everyone? <laughs> I'm Ann Vaughters. I'm the chief medical officer for Melina. And I was in that little sl slideo thing. I don't know. That was cute. I'd never seen that before. So there you go. We got you on record. You were here. All right. So thank you. So next we'll um, hear from United. Trying to get off mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I will be brief in the interest of time. My name is Muhammad Ali. I'm the chief medical officer uh, for our um, program here in, uh, in, in Virginia. Um, and uh, you asked about midwifery and uh, reimbursement for care and home and birth uh, birth centers and home births. Um, I, I would start by saying that um, if there's nothing I would want you to take away is what you already know, that disparities and in health inequities exist for pregnant and parenting individuals, especially in the Medicaid space. And so with that high level approach, it means even though one's birthing location may be a personal choice, uh, the, there may be limitation in what's available to different of our members based on social determinants and, and based on uh, racial and, and, uh, and health disparities. Um, the, so, so for us, access to comprehensive services and supports such as midwives, uh, or birth centers uh, have been, the data shows that they are linked to improved maternal and infant, infant health outcomes. And we're constantly looking to see how we can make this work within the, the setting and the constraints of needs for uh, license licensing and quality um, kind of uh, uh, filters to ensure that members are getting the best quality available. But the bottom line is really we, we support um, uh, coming together with respect to finding a way to ensure um, provider qualifications are not an issue and that we can work together across all MCOs and DMAS and the provider community uh, to remove health inequities and improve birth outcomes in, in Virginia. On the provider partnerships, um, any infrastructure that facilitates improvements in health and healthcare 
um, is is key to the rising tide for all. Um, I did speak, I think, at a couple of VAHP conferences, and and I have engaged in the past with respect to opportunities on provider partnership with MCOs. And we have two activities that uh, that I would just put out there for you. We we meet weekly um, with uh, with managing with doing what we call post acute challenging patient transition rounds with provider systems where together and so these are rounds that comprise of both uh, the, the the provider system the hospital system and uh, united where we are addressing uh, the whole magnitude of issues that range from social determinants to all the things that get in the way of effective uh, stick the landing transitions back to the community. And, uh, and thank you for the opportunity and I will yield to the next person. Thank you, United, appreciate that. And did you introduce yourself, sir? I did, and I don't mind introducing again. Hi, Mo, Muhammad Ali. The Chief Medical Officer for United Virginia Medicaid. Thank you. Now, Edna. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Corey Pleasance. I am the Chief of Staff here at Aetna. Uh, also, I'm joined today by Dr. Neil Hines, who is our Behavioral Health Medical Director, and we are filling in for Dr. Ira Bloomfield, who is our Chief Medical Officer, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but sends his his regards. Um, so just, to, you know, again, taking it both questions, um, you know, and I guess I would just kind of echo the sentiment shared by our, our our MCO peers in terms of midwifery care. Uh, we are contracted currently with over 200 midwives in the Edna Better Health Network. Uh, we have a robust, very robust case management uh, system when it comes to maternity, and and they are well versed in midwifery and and making sure that our membership is aware of those offerings and will oftentimes make referrals to providers as requested and as necessary. Um, as far as reimbursement for home births, we don't currently uh, offer reimbursement for home births, but again, much along the lines of the sentiment that you know Dr. Ali shared, we too have heard a lot of, uh, we received a lot of feedback from our stakeholders, particularly working with doula groups, um, and you know a variety of, of OBGYN stakeholder groups that are, you know, have put home births uh, in our purview and in our attention. And so we are doing some research about, you know, home births and extensive use of use of birthing centers to, again, ensure equity uh, and access to our membership to these options for care. Um, in terms of our some of our innovative provider solutions, one that we wanted to share particularly today um, is with an organization called MedZed. And so we've been able to partner with MedZed on what they call MedZed House Calls. And so, you know, essentially it is a wraparound home-based uh, acute and chronic disease management service. We also provide social services and SDOH supports. Um, and it's done completely in collaboration with our members' PCPs. And essentially what MedZed will do is that they will send uh, nurses into the home to assist with remote provider visits uh, to assess and treat our members. Uh, and again, this is all done in conjunction and collaboration with our members' PCPs. And so it's kind of like a helping hand for you know what we know is an, a currently overburdened uh, healthcare workforce and and so an additional way to support our our PCP network in ensuring that we can provide additional above and beyond services to our memberships our members who may not be able to always get to you know in person doctors appointments or if their you know doctor has limited availability um, so it's a new initiative we we launched it earlier this year and so we are still monitoring for outcomes but the the feedback so far that we've been getting from provider groups from members has been nothing but positive uh, you know they really enjoy you know working with the meds ed group and and the providers and nurses on the meds ed staff to to really make some connections to the membership and we've gotten a lot of good feedback about you know providers saying that this has relieved some of the burden and has also you know helped ensure that their members are receiving the care that they need in a timely uh, a timely and effective manner and also in a variety of service settings thank you very much we appreciate that corey any questions for um edna and also united that previously spoke from the provider team and feel free to also light up the chat and you can also uh, reach out to the MCOs individually. So we'll have Optima now. Can you hear me? I hope I unmuted myself. Yes, um, we can hear you. I'm, I'm Mark Manningly, I'm Vice President of Medical Affairs at Optima. Uh, on the question of maternal health and midwives, we do cover midwives 
and we don't have any restrictions on them. Um, right now, we're trying to build out some birthing centers in our Centera facilities. However, we do not have any contracts at this time, sort of like what others are saying. Uh, the same with home births. None of the midwives that we're contracted with currently do home births, but we are open to that. So it's something that is being explored in that whole thing. But as I said, we're working, like others have said, to the holistic approach to all of our, um, with our revamped and enhanced maternal health program. A lot of aggressive outreach has been going on with the doula program that DMAS has um, implemented, and I can see where this would run in parallel with that. The um, partnerships, uh, it's almost hard to just pick one out because a lot of that is wrapped into so many of the value-based contracts. Um, one area that we've obviously focused on over the years has been trying to find ways into the contracts to enhance uh, vaccines. And um, a simple thing like enhancing um, reimbursements for the providers to provide the vaccines uh, has had an uptick of significant numbers in the vaccinations in our kids. This is the time of the year that they're all going back to school. So the vaccines are a high priority right now in that and trying to get them back in and getting the vaccines. I know since COVID vaccination rates in the kids especially fell off the track and we're trying to get them back on the track and some encouraging signs are starting to show up and I defer to my pediatrician friends over there, especially Anne, who I know lives this world all the time. But, um, you know, that is one area that we concentrate on. A lot of the value based contracts are aligned a lot with our quality measures and, you know, getting the usual uh, routines. And one of the things that we've actually done, and this is something that goes back years, is we give a Golden Globe Award to a provider that's worked close with our Medicaid uh, providers. It's an annual award that's given every year. It's a primary care provider out in the community that's um, recognized for their high quality standards. And that has been greatly appreciated by a lot of providers saying, you know, we have an MCO that's recognizing them. And um, we just recently named it for one of our former um, physicians in our company, Dr. Melvin Penn, who passed away. And so now it's going to be memorialized as his uh, reward for the rest of, um, you know, we continue to run that. So again, you could talk about all the value-based contracts, but that's a lot of nitty gritty that nobody wants to hear. Oh, we do, just not today, but we do. <laughs> we might bring I know it's back. a hot <laughs> button topic, but that is really the direction we're really pushing very aggressively. Absolutely. That was one of the questions um, on the survey. So that'll be something for our next meeting. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. And now, last but not least, Anthem. Hi, good afternoon. And we're responding to the questions that we received ahead of time. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Okay. So this is Sharon Deans. I'm actually the Regional Vice President for Clinical Services, Strategy and Operations for the Northeast region and Virginia is one of my markets. I'm currently the interim PPMD and I welcome the opportunity to get to learn Virginia and, and get to know folks in Virginia a little bit more closely. Um, and so on the question on the midwifery, uh, I was under the assumption that midwifery was an included benefit um, and wanted to understand myself better, the, the I guess the strategic um, line of questioning around why are we are exploring this? Are we looking to extend the midwives? Um, uh, you know their capability. Do they uh, do they practice solo? How many do we have in um, in our rural region? So anybody that knows me is they know that I you ask me a question and I start thinking and I have a ton of questions to ask back um, to see if we can provoke a conversation um, on how we're going to do things and so. My curiosity was piqued when we asked about this because I'm like, are we using them as physician extenders? Um, birthing centers, I think, are a great tool, um, but want to be clear how they are, you know, resourced, um, you know, staffing-wise, uh, your location, 
near full service um, labor and delivery in case of an emergency and you know whether or not they're freestanding or supervised or in a facility actually and then supervised by physicians or directly managed by the midwives. Um, and then for the uh, provider collaboration and outcomes, just like everyone else, we have value-based contracting. Um, I've been involved with value-based value contracting for about 10 years. Um, a lot of work in New York. Um, if anybody's familiar with New York Medicaid, we were forced to the table on that under a fabulous Medicaid director. Uh, it was painful, but it was great work. Um, and I think the key to it is the relationship building and helping folks to understand. I think one of um, our examples of good value-based contracting, so to speak, this is more of a level one, maybe bought in a level two, is our OB uh, quality improvement program where we have select physicians in an OB clip. Um, and these are showing very nice outcomes, but the 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 um, the goal is to increase their awareness around population health management. And so we're looking to decrease primary C-section rate, increase postpartum rate, and we have some other measures there. Um, I think it's a very unique um, approach to our OB population, particularly in this time when we need um, increased awareness around population health. I practiced for 25 years at the bedside in New York. Um, I'm sorry, I just realized I didn't have my camera on. I practiced for 25 years at the bedside in New York um, and all of my incentive money went to the primary care doc because I was referring everybody for the mammograms and doing all the paths and they got paid for it based on the attribution. So I think we're at a pretty unique place there, but um, there's no way to avoid value-based contracting. It gives us the population health management, which I think is essential. Um, you know, the pandemic ripped the Band-Aid off and uh, we're forced to take a look at these issues and act upon them. Thank you, Dr. D. I know that uh, your training is in, um, you know, OBGYN, obstetrician and gynecology. So I know you would have a lot to say and thoughts about that. And I think that's an opportunity for a think tank or a group uh, to talk about uh, how we can uh, use our midwives as extenders. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the plans um, for sharing that information, for um, replying back to the questions. We appreciate it. And that's what it's about. Really, this meeting is to foster conversation, like you said, Dr. Dean, partnership on issues that matter to us all, because of course, we're the, the end of it all is about the, the member or the patient, the Medicaid uh, recipient. So thank you for that. Any questions from our provider community associations for our MCOs regarding these topics? This is not the end. So, you know, we're going to have other meetings and, and, and talk about important issues such as value-based care, um, some of the work we do in hospitals. We wanted to open up uh, the forum for a few moments um, from our provider group. Shy Bunch. All right, um, feel free to use the chat. Uh, look at the names you have on your screen. Uh, we have representation from all of our MCOs. They are here and they are looking forward to partner with our providers. So um, please feel free to, to make those important connections. Um, like you said, uh, Dr. Vodders, it's about communication and relationships. So that's important. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Steven, okay, if I can just make a plea. Um, yes. And so in doing this work these last few years, um, you know, we've come to the, to the table in many different capacities around many different topics. Um, and one in particular, you know, I took the team to the table and set the tone and then I dropped back and let the team handle it. But I had to come back in because as we elaborated on the initiative, they kept leaving us out. And I had to come back in to explain to them that we are a real part of the healthcare delivery system, the managed care organization. We are just not a payer. OK, and I think a lot of folks have a mindset, not necessarily the folks in the room, but a mindset that we, um, you know, that we um, uh, we only pay. We don't. We have a lot of resources available. All of the plans have a lot of resources available for the members and, and we need the partnership with the providers to to make sure that we deliver those services. Um, I think the biggest the 800 pound gorilla in the room is trust. And I think there's been a paradigm. I interview people and they say, oh, you guys don't want to pay. And I'm like, OK, well, 
So that's not true. They're managing resources and resources are limited. Um, but, you know, the trust is something that you earn along the way. Um, it takes more than one conversation to get there. But I would just ask that everybody come, you know, come to the table, assuming the positive and give us the opportunity to reset the tone so that we can move along to do the work that we need to do for our populations. Well said, Dr. Dean. I appreciate that. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite equations is the trust equation, which is credibility plus reliability in relationships over self-awareness, which means we put ourselves low, our separate agendas are low because it's all about the patient, the Medicaid recipient. But in order for us to work together and have trust, we have to have reliability, credibility, and relationship. And that's what this committee uh, is about. So thank you for that. And I know that you, the other MCOs share that sentiment. So speaking about uh, getting out there and pressing the flesh and building those relationships, uh, there's an event that's coming up in the near future. And we have Carla Callahan from DMAS is going to talk to us about that. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Price Stevens. I'm happy to be here today to share some exciting news. I am Carla Callahan, the Assistant Division Director for Healthcare Services, and we have some exciting news on August 24th. So mark your calendars. DMAS will host a provider summit in Southwest Virginia. The event will be held at the Southwest Ed Higher Education Center in Abington. Yes, Abington. So we want you to come on down. We're looking to have, you know, to hear from you. Um, we want you all to join the conversation conversation. We'll have conversations around maternity, behavioral health, and pharmacy. Um, also, some of the goals of the event, what we're looking to do is, one, educate you, know, you the provider community, and stakeholders about DMAS priorities. Um, and also to better understand, and this is, you know, probably the most important one, we are looking to better understand regional factors impacting care and outcomes. Um, so we want you to reserve your seat today, share with your colleagues. I'm going to place the registration link in the chat now um, for you to register. And that's all. I want to take up too much time. I know we're getting to the end uh, of the um, agenda, but if you have any questions, feel free to um, reach out when you uh, get the registration link. There'll be information to contact us. So thank you and see you on August 24th. I love it. Thank you. There's a question in the chat from um, Craig Connors, and it's about uh, will the MCO be represented? So if you could answer that one. Yeah, sure. Yes, the, and the MCOs will definitely be invited to this event, and some of the MCOs you probably have already received your personal invitation from Dr. Price Stevens. Absolutely. So um, please help us and spread the word. We're talking about connecting, um, somewhat extending that olive branch. Um, so MCOs, I'm, I'm, I'm call to action is to take that. Uh, so take that flyer and pass it to everyone you know, all your provider networks. We're going to do the same. And also um, our close association partners like Craig, if you could please get that flyer and, and spread the word. And uh, we're starting in Southwest, but this is going to be a road show. And so we'll be going to all the other regions uh, as well. So we look forward uh, to engaging. So with that, um, you saw the survey results. Which way was the horse walking? I think the majority of folks said it was walking backwards. So psychologists have studied this optical illusion and have concluded that if you saw the horse walking backward, you're actually right brain, which means that you tend to tap into your creative style. You look at the big picture and you experience three emotion. For those of us who see the horse walking forward, we're more left brain. We tend to be more analytical, detail. We rely on logic, not emotion. And we think of things in sequence. So this helps inform our next meeting, how we want, how you like to uh, receive information, which was great. It, this, it really works out because you wanted to hear stories about what the MCOs were doing. And that's more on the emotional side. Some of us wanted to see data. And so we'll tap into that for our next meeting. Um, the mandate requires that we meet semi-annually, but I would just like to propose that we meet at least quarterly, bring the, the group together, uh, reemphasize what Dr. Dean was saying about building those uh, relationships. So um, please be look out 
uh, for any further for further meetings that are going to be coming along the way. Um, we're going to send out surveys to get your thoughts on what you would like to hear, and that's everyone. DMAS, uh, our MCO partners, our provider groups, we want to hear from everyone so that we continue to build on, on this uh, great opportunity to work together. So any last words, comments? Uh, we stay on time. We have two minutes uh, to spare. And of course, I always will defer to uh, our director um, if she would like to close, close us out or have any last statements. No, I'm glad that you all joined us. Um, if you can say in the chat, if you can quickly just say quickly, if you thought it was a good meeting or need some work, um, I thought this was a great first meeting for you, and I'm glad you're on board as always, and I'm glad that you did the work to pull everybody together. So if you can in the chat, would you just give us some encouragement so that Dr. Um, Price Stevens will be able to see as she's saying goodbye that you appreciate her effort and her work. Well, thank you for that, and if you know me, I'm going to send out a survey uh, for your feedback as well, and uh, with that, Happy hump day. You made it through the week almost. Uh, thank you for the great work you're doing. Uh, keep on keeping on and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank bye. You.